In the 1980s, Phil Collins had a song called Land of Confusion. Some of you might remember that song. When you look at the religious world about us and the mindset of society that we're living in, it very much is a land of confusion. As illustrated by this sign, people are saying this way to God. This is how you get to God. You have all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of mindsets, all kinds of thinking in our world. Uh, Catholicism, Evangelicalism, Mormonism, Judaism, Protestantism, Buddhism. And there are so many more isms you could put on that sign. This way to God. This way to God. And people think and sincerely think that all of those different viewpoints are okay. In fact, that is the basic mindset of the religious world in America. A recent survey shows that most Americans, 70% agree with the statement that many religions can lead to eternal life. 70% of Americans believe that you can choose any religion you want and it will get you to heaven. That includes also more than half of the members of the evangelical Protestant churches. 57% of them also believe that the different religions can lead to eternal life. Now, evangelicals are supposed to be people who believe in the Bible. They claim to believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, yet over half of them say that any religion can get you to heaven. Yet they must not believe what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6. They cannot believe that and say that any religion can get you to heaven. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no way to reconcile that with the concept of pluralism. No way. And that's exactly what that philosophy is. Pluralism is the concept that all different viewpoints are correct. If it's correct for you, it may not be correct for me. And what's correct for me may not be correct for you, but we'll all eventually get to heaven. That is religious pluralism. And that causes us to be in a land of confusion. A land of division, where everyone is doing that which is right in their own eyes. But we're going to see tonight that that is not what God wants. He has never wanted people to be divided. He has never wanted His people to be divided. And so tonight we're going to look at biblical unity. How we can have a true unity among those who want to go to heaven, those who want to have eternal life. We're not going to look to the philosophy of men. We're not going to look to the different types of religion and try to find common ground in each one of those religions. We're going to appeal to the Bible because we do believe the Bible is the Word of God. And therefore, it is instructions on how we can get to heaven, on how we can have eternal life. God has always wanted us to have unity. Psalm 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He says it's good, it's pleasant for brethren not to be at odds with one another, but to dwell together in unity. Even in the Old Covenant, we see that God wanted His people to have unity. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Can we walk together? Can we be together unless there is agreement among us? Unless there is unity. 
It's interesting that the word unity is only found four times in the Bible. Twice in the Old Testament and twice in the New. But it's a concept found throughout the Scriptures. And therefore, we're going to look into the pages of the Bible uh, tonight, and we're going to look at how we can be one in the midst of a land of confusion. You know, Jesus talked about that. In John chapter 10, when in the context he refers to himself as the good shepherd, he refers to his people as his sheep, his followers. He says in John chapter 10 and verse 16, he says, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. He's referring to the Gentiles. He's referring to those who are not of the Jewish fold. We understand that from Ephesians chapter 2. That the Gentiles would be fellow heirs together with anyone who believes and obeys the Lord. He says, these other sheep I have, I'm going to bring them in and they will listen to me. They're going to hear my voice and there will be one flock, one church, and one shepherd one head of the church. We'll have more to say about that a little bit later on in our lesson. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. <clears throat> Philippians 1 and verse 27. Paul says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That we are of one spirit, one mind, striving together. Do you see how that God wants us to be together? And wants us to have unity for the faith of the gospel. John chapter 17. Look at the prayer of Christ. John chapter 17, you have the longest recorded prayer of Christ. This is just before He's arrested. This is just before He is crucified. This is just before His resurrection and ascension. Here is what Jesus prayed for in the longest recorded prayer of Christ. The whole chapter is His prayer. He says, I do not pray for these alone, beginning in verse 20 of John chapter 17, talking about His apostles but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's talking about you and me and all those from the first century who believe in Jesus Christ based on their testimony. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they all may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved me. Look how Jesus is praying over and over and over again about unity. Notice what Jesus didn't pray for. Jesus did not pray that his followers would be wealthy. Jesus did not pray for his followers to be popular in society. Jesus did not pray for his followers to always have good and perfect health. He could have prayed for those things, but he didn't. The primary concern on our Lord's mind before his death was his followers to be one. He grew up in a divided world. He grew up in Palestine. He grew up in Nazareth where you had religious division. You had the Pharisees. You had the Sadducees. You had the Essenes. You had the scribes. You had the Herodians. And not, not only that, but then outside of Israel you had idolatry. Everybody worshiping all kinds of gods. Religious division. It must have been very, very important for our Lord to take time to pray for this before He died. He wanted His followers to be one. 
to have unity. His apostles made a plea for unity. They made a plea for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. As Paul is writing to the Lord's church at Corinth, a church that had all kinds of problems, one of the problems that they had was religious division. And he says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now notice what he's saying. You speak the same things. You cannot do that if you have the concept of pluralism. That's speaking different things. We must speak the same things that there be no divisions. You can substitute the word divisions there and put in denominations. Because a denomination is a designated division. That there be no denominations among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And we're going to see in just a moment how we can achieve that. How that can be possible. So we see that God wants His people, Jesus prayed for His people to be one, just as He and the Father are one. And now Paul is saying here, I don't want there to be divisions among you. This is the will of God as he writes through the power of the Holy Spirit. You say the same things. No divisions. You be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How can that be? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Now, Paul here, in this context, in Philippians 3 and verse 16, is talking about spiritual maturity and how that we mature and that people who are in Christ are at different levels of maturity. He says, even though that is the the case, even though we've reached certain degrees of maturity, we are to live or walk by the same rule. That word rule in the Greek is the word for canon. And it means a means by which we measure something. That means the same standard. You've heard of the canon of Scripture? It's referring to the Scripture being the measure, being God's will, and this is how we are to be judged and to judge others. Therefore, he's saying we walk or we live according to the same standard. Even though some have only been a Christian for maybe a few weeks, others have been Christians for 50 or 60 years, yet we all have the same standard. And if we all have the same standard, we can be of the same mind. We can be of the same mind. And that's how we can speak the same things. Be of the same mind and same judgment. We all have the same standard. And that standard is the Word of God. You cannot have your standard and I cannot have my own standard and achieve this unity. We cannot be one if we have the pluralistic concept of what's right for me is, could be wrong for you and vice versa. We've got to approach God with the standard that He has given us and abide by the same rule. The plea for unity. God has given us a plan. He has given us a plan for unity in the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, look at this. He's saying, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. He wrote this from prison. That's why he said that. He's a prisoner of the Lord. And he wrote this by inspiration, in prison. You walk worthy of the calling that you were called with. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14 tells us that we've been called by the gospel. God's gospel, God's plan for us to be saved has called us unto himself 
and we are to walk worthy of that calling. That means we're to live in harmony with what we profess if we claim to be Christians. And we're to have the attitude of lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. That is the attitude of unity. And we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Notice the unity comes from the Holy Spirit. In our Sunday morning Bible class, we're studying the work of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does. And we understand that the Holy Spirit has given us the same rule. He has given us the written word. And therefore, from this Spirit-inspired book, we can learn how to be one, and we can have the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Then, Paul by inspiration gives us the seven ones of unity. Why seven? In Jewish culture, the number seven is a number of completion. He gives us seven ones of unity. It's sometimes been referred to as seven planks in the platform of unity or seven pillars that hold up unity. This is how we all can be one. And all of these are found in, uh, throughout the scripture concerning unity. First of all, there's one body. One body. In this context of a book of, of Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, he is talking about the church. Christ is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Just as you have one body and have one head, so Christ, the king, has only one body, which is the church. This is the church he promised to establish. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, when he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. And he accomplished that in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. One body. Again, that goes against the, the thinking of pluralism, in which you can join the body that you want, whatever body of believers that you like, whichever one is the most entertaining for you and your children. That's not what the Bible teaches. If we're going to abide by the same rule and obey the same gospel, we're going to wind up in the same body, which is the church. One body. There's one spirit. That's referring to the Holy Spirit. One body is unity of organization. One spirit is how God has communicated to us. Unity of communication. God through His Holy Spirit has communicated to us and we have that communication in the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, Paul says, By one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. So the Holy Spirit of God, one of the three persons of the Godhead, He is the one who has revealed this to us. And the Holy Spirit is not going to tell people different things. The Holy Spirit is not going to cause people to teach and practice things that contradict one another. That's why we have to abide by the same rule the Holy Spirit has given us. One Holy Spirit. One hope. One hope. That's unity of expectation. You know, there's not going to be a Hindu heaven and a Muslim heaven and a Mormon heaven and a Catholic heaven. No, there's only one heaven. There's only one resurrection of the righteous. There's only one hope that we're looking for. And all Christians have that one hope. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, God promised us, He gave us the hope of eternal life God who cannot lie, He promised this before the world began. One hope. So that's unity of expectation. One Lord. One Lord is referring to the unity of rulership. One Lord, Jesus Christ. That word Lord there means master. And that means authority. We are to submit to Him. 
Jesus is not only our Savior, He is our Lord. And so many people want Jesus as Savior, but they don't want Him as Lord. They don't want Him to tell them how to live, how to worship, how to conduct themselves. But yet they want Him to save them. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Acts 2 and verse 36. If we are going to benefit from Jesus being Savior, we must submit to Him as Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. One faith. Unity of belief. There is only one faith. Again, the religious world says, no, there's many faiths. You choose the faith that that best suits your needs. No, there's no choice. It's either the faith of the New Testament or it's a wrong faith. No matter how sincere someone might be, there is but only one faith. Jude verse 3 says, it's the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And that one faith is referring to the New Testament, the Bible. And therefore, it is through that one faith we come to understand this unity that God wants us to understand so that we might be one. One baptism. Unity of practice. Unity of practice. One baptism. The word baptism means to be immersed, to be dipped, to be submerged in water. So when a person obeys the gospel, as as Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. It is the baptism that cleanses us from our sins by the blood of Jesus. Acts 2 and verse 38. And Ananias told Saul, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There are not three or four different kinds of baptisms. There is but one. It's not sprinkling. It's not pouring. It's not Holy Spirit baptism. One baptism in water for the forgiveness of sins. And when we do that, God places us into the one body, which is the church. And then finally, in this plan of unity, one God and Father. Unity of worship. Unity of worship. Our worship, our devotion is directed towards God. He is the only one that we worship. He is the only one that we adore. He is the only one to whom we are to give such devotion. In John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, Jesus told the Samaritan woman, God God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We see here the seven ones of unity. This is how we can be one before the Lord. This is how we can come together and speak the same things, conduct ourselves according to the same rule. Because the one Lord, Jesus Christ, died on the cross. We have that one faith in Him because the one God and Father sent Him. The one Holy Spirit revealed the one faith. And when we obey the one baptism, we're placed into the one body, which is the church. We can be one if we want to be, but we've got to set aside the thinking of the world that every viewpoint is valid. Only God's viewpoint is valid. And we must believe and we must obey it. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, we urge you to obey that one baptism. To submit to the one Lord, Jesus Christ. Confess Him as the Son of God. Repent of all your sins and be baptized with that one baptism into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've done that and gone astray, repent. Confess your sins. Come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours. While together we stand and sing.